this is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse at www.naturalnurse.com on the web. And, of course, we're here today on the natural nurse and Dr. Z, which is brought to you by Gary Null's Network. And you can always find us at Progressive Radio Network. One of the great things is that this show is on live, and many of you I know are listening in from wherever you are in the world. But... Also, the shows are archived. So up to 12 shows are archived. So those of you who find that you have a favorite show, I suggest that you download it while it is archived live on Progressive Radio Network's website so that you can keep it and listen to it anytime you want. And, of course, you can tell your friends to join in 24-7 at prncom.net. And today, we're very, very pleased to have as our guest, Mr. Jacques Fresco. And his background includes industrial design and social engineering, as well as being a forerunner in the field of human factors. And of course, we'll allow him to tell us what that means. And he has worked as both a designer and an inventor in a wide range of fields, spanning from biomedical innovations to totally integrated social systems. And if you'd like to look online with us, check out his website at The Venus Project. It's with a T-H-E, thevenusproject.com. And his uh, not-for-profit organization, Future by Design, reflects the culmination of his life's work and the integration of the best of science and technology into a comprehensive plan for a new society based on human and environmental concerns. And there's certainly no time like the present when we can clearly see that we definitely need a brand new structure. And Mr. Fresco has been working on both the science and technology of something that would lead to I would say, an integrated and sustainable lifestyle for humans moving forward into the future. I was very, very happy to visit Mr. Fresco at his facility and see firsthand the incredible accomplishments and design elements and philosophical structures that he has been working on for many, many decades, and I would love to see it brought to a state of reality because I think it would would help humans moving forward in this um, very troubling time. So thank you so much for joining us today. And tell us, what is the Venus Project? Thank you, Ellen. Thanks for the privilege of talking to you. And tell us about your vision. What is the, the Venus Project? The Venus Project is a, an approach to maintain a society, a sustainable global society, without the need for war, poverty, hunger, all the things that have been with us for centuries. It's entirely possible to develop a world cooperative government that is free of most of the problems. The Venus Project maintains... Uh, that if you wish to live in a world of peace, we, we must eventually declare the earth as a common heritage of all the world's people in a resource-based economy in which we use resources rather than money. If you have difficulty with that, if you're stranded on an island with millions of dollars and the island has no water, no fish, and no arable land, you have nothing. It isn't money that people really need. It's access to the necessities of life. And the Venus Project is a method of attaining that. In order to attain that, you have to have, it is necessary so that social evolution brings us to the point where the monetary system collapses. I believe we're in that process now, that you cannot solve problems within a monetary system. Although money produces incentive, it also produces the incentive for corruption, embezzlement, paying off your leaders, and war. Yes, it seems like that's what it has led to, 
all these years. So a resource-based economy is not based on money. So what exactly would motivate people then to do anything? Well, people think that money is the only motivating system, or they call it the incentive system. Actually, people like Gandhi work for social change without anyone promising any money. And this is the story of Martin Luther King and all the leaders that really brought about social change did not do it for money. So if you're born in America, you have access to railway trains, airplanes, things that you had no part in. You didn't develop the highways, the motor cars, the telephones. You got all that for nothing, and it doesn't spoil people. That's the illusion that system that this system puts out there, that that uh, you have to be motivated by money to do anything. I'm afraid of people that are motivated by money. When a doctor tells me my kidney has to come out, I don't know if he's trying to pay off a new yacht or a house that he bought or whether my kidney has to come out. And a monetary system is very difficult to unravel the intentions of a person. Yes, that's an interesting concept. Now, who makes the decisions if we, you know, had a society that was open? Who would decide what the resources would be used for? Okay. First of all, we have to get the nations of the world together to join in this venture. And after that, we have to do a global survey of existing resources. That means transportation, factories, availability of materials. After a global resource survey, we can best determine how many cities are needed, how much food has to be stored, the size of the cities. But so actually no one really makes decisions. We base our decisions on the carrying capacity of the Earth's resources. Well, who's we? Like, there would have to be a panel of somebody, I imagine, you know, determining um, what would uh, what the resources would be used for. When, when I use the term we, I mean the survey committee, the people that does the work to help determine what the parameters of social design will be. In other words, I don't want it based on human opinions. I want it based on the caring capacity of the Earth's resources, which is very different than politics. Now, when I was at your house, um, you showed me some incredible things that you invented. And, for instance, you invented these cities that were circular in nature and very easy in terms of the ability of people to get around. Uh, that would be fabulous if that actually existed. How did you come to develop these city concepts? Out of necessity. In other words, I would like to see a world without poverty, hunger. And the only way to do that is to evaluate how society came to be the way it is, why there is war, why there is crime, and try to outgrow the conditions or eliminate the conditions or supersede those conditions that generate socially aberrant behavior. And when we find out what those conditions are, we will educate people out of those conditions. And another thing that you showed me that was amazing was something that exists in science called memory metal. And that was just a fascinating um, technology because you talked about the fact that things could be built in a modular fashion, shipped very easily, and, and then they would just be preformed when they arrived at their destination, which would save billions in construction costs. Well, what is really needed is the intelligent management of the Earth's resources, with, with profits to none and service to everyone. 
You see, today, when you have a war, they draft or they get volunteers to put up their lives to defend the American way of life. When they do that, you should conscript all the war industries so no one makes a profit out of war. Then it's real. When war is big business, it's a shameful thing. It has nothing to do with the benefits of humanity. We, of course, we claim that we're bringing democracy to other countries. How can you bring democracy to other countries when you really don't have it here? That's a good point. That's very true. And I think a lot of the wars that are being proliferated right now really are not necessarily something that will increase democracy, but in fact can produce more people who who have angered and who join the ranks of what's called the terrorists. Oh, well, there are many materials. You know, when you consider the memory metals or what they call um, self-reactive materials, the seed is exactly that. When you look at a seed, it has within it the whole pattern of an oak tree. Or you have a seed for a banana plant or any seeds at all. They have within it the, the end product, the tree. Now, is the seed really the beginning or the end product of the plant? I think we name things with insufficient information. We call the seed the beginning. It's really the end product of a plant. So is the, the embryo. It's not the beginning of life. It's the, the end product. And so the embryo is a changing system which is continuous and now if we learn how seeds retain that memory of a plant, of trees, of palm trees, of all that, then we might be able to engineer materials with a memory. In other words, those materials will be used to record the process. And once we learn how to record the process of memory in materials like a seed, we'll be able to design buildings and products that are self-generating. Yes, that's amazing. I noticed that everything was very modular in the city systems that you produce. So buildings could be added onto easily without breaking them down. Everything was based on uh, construction materials that lasted a very, very long time, that were cost-effective, and it was really an excellent model for a um, something that would really work. Ellen, we don't want things to wear out and break down. That's called planned obsolescence. When you plan your cities of the future, they will be nothing like the cities of today. They're chaotic. They're based on architectural ego in which each building is different, a different size. That's utter chaos. When you plan a city, you have built-in transportation, art centers, music centers, schools, dental care, medical, right in the center of the city. So all districts are the same distance in the city. The way cities are today, you have to drive north to take your kid to school, south for dental care, then you have to drive in a different direction for medical care. They're completely chaotic. They have nothing to do with human welfare. I have never seen a planned city yet, although they use the term planned cities. There should be gardens, art centers, music centers. You know, look at children today, high school kids. They hang out in malls because there's no place to go or they'll hang out at a Coke stand. Actually, there should be art centers, music centers, places for these kids to go. And as long as we build our cities as chaotic as they are, we're going to waste a lot of mileage, a lot of fuel, a lot of air pollution, and a lot of unnecessary roadways and travel to maintain our type of economic system, which is completely chaotic. Well, it certainly is chaotic, and it also produces pollution and um, other problems that interfere with health. 
Thank now, you. tell us about your book, The Best That Money Can't Buy. Yes, well, not only are the distances unnecessary, uh, we produce a lot of pollution by waste and improper recycling and exhaust of automotive systems. In other words, we do not have an integrated society. Uh, take this, for example. Uh, Miami Beach is crowded Saturday and Sunday. If one-seventh of the population got off every day, you'd have no crowding, no freeway jams, none of the problems you have today without building new bridges. Yes, that's true. That would be such a different thing. That uh, <laughs> that exists only now in rural areas where there isn't a lot of concentration of people. But with your system set up and your city set up, there's a way to integrate country living, food growing, and high technology all together in a very sane and environmentally friendly way. Well, you see, in order to overcome many of these problems, we really don't have the time now, but the book that I've written called The Best That Money Can't Buy is about how we get from here to there and thousands of questions that the average person might ask what happens to individuality in, a, in, in such a social design, who makes the decisions. All that information is in the book. I will try to answer most of those questions now if I can. Uh, is there anything in particular you'd like me to answer? Well, what we're going to do is we'll take a little break right now for about um, two minutes. And when we come back, we will certainly talk about your vision and many of the things that people can find on the Venus Project at thevenusproject.com. So we're going to take just about a two-minute break right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And when we come back, we will continue our discussion with Jacques Fresco and talking about his vision on the Venus Project, the books that he's written, and the many um, facilities that he has included in his visionary work. We will be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z.
welcome back as we come back to the natural nurse and Dr. Z. And we'd like to thank those who help bring you this radio show, and that is Nature's Answer. And Nature's Answer has been providing all natural remedies to health-conscious consumers since 1972. And Nature's Answer is always using uh, excellent packaging that does not break down and pollute the environment, as well as uh, top-quality wild herbs and an entire compendium of natural remedies. And you can see more at their website at naturesanswer.com. And today, right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z, we have as our guest uh, Jacques Fresco, and he is representing his project, The Venus Project. You can always find out more at thevenusproject.com. And Mr. Fresco's background includes industrial design, social engineering, as well as being a forerunner in the field of human factors. He has worked as both a designer and inventor in a wide range of fields, spanning from biomedical innovations to totally integrated social systems. The Venus Project and the nonprofit organization Future by Design reflects the culmination of Mr. Fresco's life work, the integration of the best of science and technology into a comprehensive plan for a new society based on human and environmental concern. It is a global vision of hope for the future of humankind in our technological age. And you can go to a great place to see his work also is YouTube. If you go to YouTube.com and type in J-A-C-Q-U-E, Fresco, F-R-E-S-C-O, you can see many YouTubes there. In fact, they seem to be increasing by the day. There's so many that are going up. And one in particular of interest is where you were on Larry King Live, and I believe that was all the way back in 1974. And uh, you already had completed the entire vision that you're talking about today. And boy, if we had started building the city of the future then, I think we would not be in the mess that we were in right now because it is based on such solid technology and solid science and maintaining a focus on the human and environment. If we started in the past. I don't know what you said. Helen, would you mind repeating that question? Right. Sure. Well, you can just tell us about the fact that you were talking about this decades ago, and there was an interview on Larry King Live in the 1970s. About I did talk about these things years ago. Yes. In fact, we could have built a sane society for the cost of World War II. We could have wiped out all the slums in the world, built hospitals and cities all over the world. How stupid can nations be to spend that money on training people to become killing machines? If we took that same money that we spend on the war and taught men, young men and women, how to solve problems, how to bridge the difference between nations and produce an abundance rather than turn them out to be killing machines, we could have accomplished a great deal more. I would say, as a whole, all societies today are led by people that really don't have any basic knowledge of human ecology, that is, the factors that shape human values. Yes, that's true. And how what how would your system differ? How would your system differ? Well our system, instead of training people to be specialists like chemists, engineers, physicists, biologists, we work on multidisciplinarians. So people have an understanding of anthropology, sociology, psychology and human factors. When people have a broad understanding of environment, they are more prepared to become a democratic society. You don't have a democratic society. We never had it. If people cannot afford to feed their children nutritious food, either due to lack of knowledge or lack of purchasing power, 
you can't have a democracy. A democracy is when all people have access to the necessities of life, a good education, whether they can afford it or not, we will provide those things for all people all over the world. When people have access to the necessities of life, there's no territorial disputes. If you live near a waterfall with lots of drinking water, no one steals it. If you make things available to people, there is no basis for crime except the serial killers and certain types of aberrant behavior, which we can deal with early in the schools and get rid of the conditions that produce aberrant behavior, rather than putting people in jail, using police. Remember this again. If people have access to the necessities of life, they tend to be easily to get, easier to get along with, uh, more cooperative. But when you deprive people of things, you produce aberrant behavior. And they, they try to tell you in our schools today, in our social institutions, our newspapers and our books, that we have free will. You really don't have free will because you're pumped. That is, ever since you're a child, what's the greatest country in the world, the U.S.? I'm proud to be an Italian. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to be a Swede. You're dividing people. There's no such thing as Jewish studies, Polish studies. There are only human studies, and all humans need clean air, clean water, arable land, and a relevant education. It's the division of people that I worry about. Yes, and we see that seems to be escalating instead of decreasing. That's escalating instead of decreasing. Yes, you're right, because they're trying to produce more patriotic behavior. I think it was Einstein that said patriotism is a disease. It separates people and does not inform us as to the contributions made by all nations to make our country great and all other countries. Yes, that's true. Now, tell us about um, your teachings on religion. Religion. Well, I think that religion is an attempt to control the behavior of people in a scarcity society. In other words, they are trying to do the right thing, but they don't know enough about human behavior to do the right thing. Now, you, you don't do the right thing by making laws. Uh, laws are man-made, and the devices are attempting to control behavior. You know, nations sign treaties together. But if those treaties do not serve the advantage of the nation, they will violate it. We've signed a lot of treaties, the United States, but we break them if they don't serve our interests. So treaties and laws, most of them, are artificial. Rather than treaties and laws or paper proclamations as to the rights of the individual, everyone has access from the access centers to their needs, just like the public library. You can check out a book at the camera centers. You can check out a camera. At the golf club, at the golf course, you can check out golf clubs, play golf, and leave them there. That makes more things available for more people. You know, we, we have millions of automobiles that sit around for eight hours in front of an industrial plant. Now, automobiles do not need rest. So what we have is automobiles designed to move people around, and they're always in use. We don't have freight yards, yards filled with freight cars hoping that business will boom. We no longer rely on money. We no longer rely on exploitation or abuse of anyone. In other words, we produce, we produce goods and services designed not to wear out or break down. What a novel idea. It seems that most things are built to break down with planned obsolescence. Yes. Now, we will design clothing by anatomists by uh, people who study the physical body, and the clothing would not pull. It would be designed to yield so you can move freely. 
shoes would breathe as you walk. It would not squeeze any portion of your foot. Shoes have to be designed by physiologists, anatomists, not some artist. Although that was great a hundred years ago, today we can do much better. Yes, and cer- we certainly could. Now, how would the future cities be designed, and could we afford to build new cities? Well, the question is uh, not how much will the new cities cost. The real question is do we have the resources to build new cities and hospitals all over the world? We have more than enough resources. You know, when you think of war, they give everybody a billion-dollar airplane, machine guns, tanks, everything soldiers need. Why can't we do that in peace? Why can't we train people to go to schools, to give them books free of charge, just like you do in the Army? Instead of blowing up cities, we build cities. In other words, if you share your resources, if all the world pool their efforts together, instead of build armies, which they spend most of their money and natural resources and even their scientific minds they use to develop weapons of mass destruction. How stupid can you be? I think that the future will look back at us as a shameful generation. That goes for all nations. I believe that all nations today are basically corrupt because they all are based their decisions on money. The whole banking system is corrupt. I think that if you understand Charles A. Lindbergh's dad, always worked for a national bank operated by the government, so no one made a profit on it. In other words, if you still have difficulty with that, can picture a community with about 50,000 people, and they all put in 10 bucks to build a community bank. So when you borrow money from a community bank owned by all the people, all the interest goes to the community. And so you get new buildings, a more income for teachers, a higher standard of living for everyone in the community. In the private system, you have people milking the public continuously. In other words, if somebody bangs into your car, somebody makes a thousand dollars straightening out the dents. If you get a dental infection, a dentist makes a lot of money repairing it. So we all are sort of predators one upon another, and that's the monetary system. It's essentially, basically corrupt in its structure. Yes, and it seems to have led to all kinds of havoc. Now, on your website, thevenusproject.com, you have so much excellent information. Tell us about how great geothermal energy and, and why it should be considered as a renewable energy source. Um, I use the term geothermal energy because there are many fumaroles under the ocean. There are all kinds of volcanic areas that we can tap, and there's enough energy to operate for thousands of years just using that alone. I'm not talking about wind power, wave power, photoelectric power. Uh, If we can harness just the movement of the Gulf Stream alone, we can generate all the power we need. There's no shortage of anything except brains in Washington. You see, politicians are not technical. They don't know how to solve problems. They make laws. Politicians, some of them may be sincere, but they are ignorant of the process for solving human problems. When they resent something of another nation, they declare war against that nation. And that is not the answer. That was good 200 years ago. Today, we have the capacity to produce an abundance of goods and services and make it available to everyone on Earth. We can build a beautiful second Garden of Eden throughout the world. But you can't do it with Jimmy Carter's methods of a hammer and nail trying to put up a house for Americans. You can't do it that way. We can lay houses like eggs by the millions. We can house everyone today, but with a hammer and nails, a hand tool economy, you can't accomplish anything. All that was great 50 or 60 years ago. Like I say, politicians do not have the kind of knowledge 
necessary to make the world a better place. Well, how can we get them that knowledge? You can't. You have to wait till the system breaks down. Unfortunately, we're at that point now. Our system is breaking down, and we've given these billions of dollars to the same people that created the problems. So you see, we're giving banks money rather than building a new infrastructure for society because the in-group really controls people. All this bull that you get out there about individuality, if we were individuals, we couldn't be controlled. So they try to make people uniform, and they keep talking about freedom and democracy. Whenever you hear those words, freedom and democracy, watch out. Individuality, you couldn't control people if you had that. So you see, they try to make people uniform so you can control them. Yes, I think that's very insightful. And uh, it seems, though, like many of these things you have talked about for probably 50 years. And what steps could we take now so that we could have a better future? Well, I think that the decisions we have to make now is to become better informed. Look up the Venus Project. Um, look up, look at our website. We have lots of different bits of information for city construction, recycling waste, what to do with the radioactive material we use up. We're contaminating the environment with it today. All these, they've done hundreds of tests, nuclear tests in the atmosphere. This is, we're going to have to pay for that in the future. We've used waste material in war. We, we've dropped radioactive dust on different countries. They're going to be radioactive for thousands of years. The big job is to clean all that up, inform the public as to what sustainability really means. And the only place you're going to get it today is at www.thevenusproject.com. Look at our website and look at our books and our videotapes. And in that way, you'll get a real detailed picture of what it is that the Venus Project advocates. Yes, and I think that it's very broad-based. You talk about a broader spectrum of choices based on science. I know everything that you do is really actually based on the realities of science and the technologies that are available if we use science correctly. Helen, when I use the term science, I'm talking about being honest about what we have in the environment. In other words, <clears throat> if we don't base our decisions on the carrying capacity of the Earth's resources, we will lose. You can't have a population far in excess of what the Earth can carry. If you do, you're going to have <clears throat> malnutrition, disease, uh, aberrant behavior, robbery, crimes, all based upon the improper use of our environmental resources. Well... <clears throat> How do you think that, that the population can be controlled then? Will people just choose to have less children, or does that have to be instituted on them? We don't want to control the population. People should be educated to know what the carrying capacity is of each regional division of the Earth. Once you're educated to know that, you then realize that your population and everything else must coincide with available resources, not some opinions of politicians. So how does it look now in terms of the population of the Earth, in terms of numbers? I think we still have the carrying capacity to provide more than that which is required. We're still okay, but if we go on multiplying... And uh, I think that will hurt us. We have to have the ability to solve problems. 
Well, certainly you give you give a lot of information about specific steps that could be taken, um, and I know that you have an interesting concept. What do you do for ha- perhaps with people who decide to you know have criminal activities? What would we do that? What would we do with them in your system? Right now, the United States has more people in prison than any other country. Yes, this is true. In other words what they call criminal behavior. You know, in the old days, a criminal was considered a person that removed some object from you or your home without your permission. Today, there's a new definition of a criminal, one who's caught. Right. (laughs) That's true. So what we have to do, you have criminal behavior in all human beings, you have criminal, most criminal behavior, I would say, is in Washington, D.C. In other words, the Pentagon, all that behavior would be considered criminal in the future. All lawyers would be considered criminal in a sane society. All judges would be considered criminal because they don't go into the nature and the background that produce that behavior. We intend to outgrow the need for criminal behavior. We intend to outgrow the conditions that produce jealousy and envy. Although you're taught that that is human nature, that's another tremendous lie. That is not human nature. It's our environment that produces jealousy, envy, all of the behavior patterns that you consider criminal are produced by the environment we live in. So if people were... We're living in a resource-based society. There would be less criminal behavior to begin with. There's no basis for criminal behavior. If people have access to the necessities of life, they don't steal. They're more amiable, easier to get along with. What do you think people fight over? They fight over money. Couples that are married that have insufficient funds. You know, I've been wearing the same dress for three months. Honey, I need a new dress. And the guy says, look, the car broke down. If I don't fix it, I can't get to work. So you have socioeconomic pressures rather than criminal behavior. And that's what promotes it. So what is different from the society that you see um, to what's called let's say, socialism. Is it different from socialism? Yes, it's different from socialism and communism. Socialism concerns itself with the working classes. Communism uses money, social stratification, prisons, police, armies, navies. We don't have any of those things. We don't even have a government. We use electronic means for managing the distribution of goods and services. We use automation in our plants, and we free human beings to go back to school, get into the arts, creative fields, write music, write plays, travel. In other words, we can automate most boring jobs, and that does humans very little good to work. They they say, you know, it's absolutely necessary to work. Well, consider a young girl that typed for a corporation for 20 years. You know what she's got in her head when she retires? Corporate letters. In school, they don't teach you how to relate, how to find meaning in your own life, how to use your creative abilities. They don't teach us how to live, how to share ideas with other people. They teach us how to become a cog in a wheel, and obedient to the established culture. An established culture is one that worked for the power elite, and they try to keep things as they are. When people are elected to political government, they are not put there to change things. They are put there to keep things as they are. And so the society we talk about would be an emergent society, not utopian. All that is bull. There is no such thing as a utopian society. You cannot achieve that because all things continue to change. The radio set of 20 years ago, television of two years ago is different today, and it will be different tomorrow. There are no city designs that are perfect. They're the best we can do up to now. 
Even the cities I design will be a straitjacket to the kids of the future. They'll design their own cities. So there are no final frontiers. Well, it's a constantly evolving process. Now, you talk, you write a beautiful essay on the website, The Venus Project, called The Future and Beyond. And in it, you talk about past philosophers who have um, sort of initiated some of these ideas which you've brought forward into our time. For instance, in 1898, Edward Bellamy wrote the book Looking Backward. Yes, Edward Bellamy did a beautiful job in that book, Looking Backward. He also wrote other books like Equality. But Edward Bellamy was not technical. He was not able to point out what should be done to enrich the lives of all the world's people. Rather than, uh, as we do today, we put up signs on the road, drive carefully, slippery when wet. What we would do is put abrasive in the highway so it's not slippery when wet. We don't need signs. School district, 15 miles an hour. The power output in a school district would be 15 miles an hour. If you leave things up to people, you're going to have trouble. People try to manage socialism, communism, free enterprise. They All the systems broke down and ultimately became corrupt. So I think when people are finally moved out, don't let that scare you. What I mean is when people used to operate elevators, they used to turn a crank and they couldn't quite get the elevator up to the floor. When the elevators became automated, you press 17 and the elevator stops exactly at that floor. At all airports today, that is modern airports, you have trains without humans in them, and they stop perfectly, and they start, and they tell you what the next stop is going to be, and you don't need humans doing that. Let's set the humans back to school, to art centers, music centers, cultural centers, being creative, problem solving. In other words, instead of going to work every day, if a young girl goes to work every day and she stands behind the counter in a department store, that doesn't use her brain. She's just selling one product. So we would like to use the brains of all people and teach them all how to become artists, musicians, problem solvers, technicians, but there would be no professions that contributed nothing. And those professions are investment banking, bankers, advertising, war industries, there'd be no such industries. And when somebody said to me, will everybody be alike in the future? They will in certain areas. They'll all be against war. They'll all greet all people with maximum courtesy, no matter what race they happen to be. In other words, sure we'll be alike. We wouldn't want to hurt anybody or kill anybody or bomb any cities. We would all be alike in those areas. There's nothing the matter with being alike if it's socially constructive. Yes, that's true. So so there would be a different viewpoint in how people view the world and a different sense of working together with each person contributing um, whatever their talents are. Exactly that, Ellen, because... When people are self-centered and they achieve a great deal of wealth, power, and property, they feel successful. That's all considered socially offensive behavior in the future because we have enough resources and enough technology and enough problem solvers and production technology to, to give everyone a very high standard of living. I know there's a lot of people that don't understand that. We have more than enough resources to give everyone the highest standard of living possible. Our project is to bring out the best in all human beings. There is no personal gain over someone else. There's no one with ambition to control anyone. We don't want to control anyone. We want to make things available to people as I said before, such as education and necessities of life, so that there's no need for aberrant behavior. And people that are born with brain damage will be cared for, and people that commit crimes 
will be helped during the transition. That period is one we have to go through to get to a resource-based economy. During the transition, there will be problems. What kind of problems? Well, there will be, as we're going through it now, the system is breaking down. Yes, it is. What's going to follow is mass riots of the, of the majority of people. The, the minorities will rise up and take food if they're not given food. And they were going to have difficulty managing a population in a state of chaos. And so they're going to use the Army and the Navy and the National Guard to keep people in control. That's called fascism. We're at the, we'll be at the midsection of fascism in the next six months. So we're going to, there's no way out of this problem except the redesign of a culture. And we're trying to get a motion picture out, Ellen, that deals with how you get from here to there. And this motion picture can travel all over the world and get to millions of people in just a few months. And if we don't get that motion picture out, I fear for the future. I think people tend to repeat the same thing over and over again because they have no alternative. Another group of people that bother me, Ellen, is the 1929 liberal. They always point out the shortcomings of our culture, but if they don't offer an alternative, what can you do about it? They leave people in midair. So when you meet with a liberal in the future, say, okay, what do we do about it? How do we solve this problem? How do we solve that problem? If they can't offer that, they have nothing to offer. Well, I want to thank you so much for all the work you have been doing all these years. I invite people to take a look at the venusproject.com because I think you have laid out um, a very specific plan of action that could lead to a much saner as well as a more sustainable future. And, of course, as we see the tumbling of um, society as we know it, right at this time there's no better time to take a look at the many excellent and um, future possibilities for a humanistic way of life on this planet. Thank you, Ellen, for the privilege of allowing me to present these ideas. And thank you, listeners, for joining us once again right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. You can listen anytime by going to Progressive Radio Network, and we'd like to thank our sponsors, Nature's Answer, for helping to bring you this show, and you can check them out at naturesanswer.com. Until next time, this is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, hoping that you stay healthy.